Hi, everyone. Welcome to this conversation uh, with Nami. I am so excited to be here with the awesome Anfan. Uh, and we'll be talking a little bit about AAPI mental health during this month of Mental Health Month, as well as AAPI Heritage Month. And I'll allow Anne to uh, introduce yourself first to the wonderful audience. Hi, everyone. First of all, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here and talk about mental health because I think that's it's more important than ever to speak up about it. And of course, it's Mental Health Awareness Month. So a little bit about myself. I am an actress and a model, and I love to write. And I'm also a healthcare worker in pandemic. And this year, I'm kind of finishing up my title as Miss Vietnam America Regency International 2021. And I just think it's very important to talk about mental health today because you know I've experienced a lot we all experience a lot from last year from the pandemic so and especially during this you know also asian american heritage month with the anti-asian bias i think this is a much needed conversation thank you so much uh, and uh, a little bit about me. I'm Diana. I am proudly a NAMI ambassador. Uh, I am here as the founder and executive director of Letters to Strangers, the largest global youth for youth mental health nonprofit, impacting specifically 13 to 24 year olds, but also towards a larger demographic as well. So it's an honor and pleasure to be here today to support NAMI as well as to have this important conversation. Uh, so let's get started then. Uh, I'm curious, you know, if you can provide a little bit on your background or perhaps your lived experience with mental illness to the extent that you feel comfortable with. So uh, I think we all kind of know that in the Asian American community and like it's very difficult to speak up about it. Um, I grew up in a very small town of Arkansas and you know, something about my family is we're very conservative, we're very religious and you know, there's this kind of like this little stigma that comes with, you know, being Asian American, it's very hard for Asian parents to express um, emotions. And I think growing up, my parents were always like, we work really hard, we're refugees, and we survived pretty much the war. You know, my parents are both survivors of the fall of Saigon of April 30th, 1975. And, you know, there's this, you know, there's a lot of PTSD, there's a lot of trauma to, you know, all we can, we can all relate to that and my generation. So it was very difficult. My parents, you know, kind of see mental health as kind of like weakness. And, you know, there's, there's this, this like such difficulty and there's just so much space and boundary about having this conversation. I remember I was like um, talking to my father about it. And he's like, well, you know, you just cover it up with Worth, your worth ethic. You can cover it up with, you know, getting good grades in school or, or, or succeeding in your field. That doesn't matter. You can just glaze over that. And through time, I realized that was my dad's, you know, his way to cope. And he was going through things as well. So I told my father, I said to him, I, there's something that's not right. I feel like I'm not happy no matter what I do, what I achieve, what I have or what I don't have, friends that I, you know, selected in my life. I feel very down, I feel very depressed. So that's when I talked about it to my sister and we talked about it and I was able to get the help that I needed. And so, yeah, I think that's a very important conversation to have with the right persons in your life. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Definitely, you know, it's a difficult thing to talk about, especially when you have that different intergenerational experience and you are oftentimes facing, in some ways, a cultural clash in some ways a cultural harmony it's you know it depends on the context and the situation uh, for me personally i was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when i was 13 and after surviving a series of suicide attempts my little brother was the one who found me and my whole journey from that point on as someone who was trying to heal as a first generation chinese american immigrant you know it's been many of those similar obstacles that you mentioned in terms of trying to understand how do we have this conversation, for example, in the language that our parents prefer to speaking, or in my case, my parents don't speak English. And so I had to learn how to adapt, you know, these Western psychiatric terms to an Eastern sort of frame of mind. And then also recognizing that intergenerational trauma is so real. You know, there's been all these studies that have been done on epigenetics or the way that our genes um, might change the way that they're expressed through 
experiences from the previous generations. And it's been found that intergenerational trauma can persist up to five generations onwards. And so just realizing that a lot of these things are not our fault, but that we might be living parts of the consequences of them, but that it's also not like a horrible, like, sentencing, you know, right? Like at the same time as we might be having these traumas, we're also inheriting a lot of the resilience and strength and healing structures. So that's something that I've been trying to keep in mind um, and just learning about how to navigate that dual pronged road between understanding where my background might require me to be a little bit more uh, specific in the help that I look for to make sure that it's culturally competent and understanding, but then also recognize that there are tools in my background that are outside of the Western psychiatric arsenal that would be helpful for my mental health journey if I only learn how to harness them. Well, thank you for sharing about your story. I think that's very empowering and we definitely need you here and you're here for a reason, you know? So. I appreciate that. Um, I guess in that case, then, you know, we kind of talked about it already, but in case there's more on it that you want to talk about, um, on the topic of how mental health is discussed in your home or in your culture, is there something you want to add on to that? Well, well like from what I said, like a lot of, like for my, at least my generation, a lot of my friends uh, definitely have the same experience with their parents because the fall of Saigon, it's, you know, like a lot of Vietnamese people had to move to America to start a better life. Um, so I, I definitely feel in a way I'm not alone at all. You know, I feel like a lot of um, my friends picked up the same traits from our parents, uh, whether it's PTSD or, you know, uh, depression or et cetera. So it's, we, we all kind of go going through the same thing, but it's very, very difficult for us to tell our parents because that that would they would see they would see that as confrontation and it's it's just a discussion to talk about you know some of my friends are lucky enough to have that conversation and some of us you know the parents kind of shut it down so it, it's it's actually you know very sad to see that but at the same time I feel like you know my parents definitely understand they're starting to get it and it's I feel very hopeful about it. Well, it's awesome to hear that, you know, even if it's one tiny step at a time. Yes. You know, I, I don't want to open them. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I think it's like as we, you know, grow in our own journeys and become more confident in our worth outside of perhaps parental validation or whatever else, they start to see that confidence in us and start to almost trust us more because we have learned to validate ourselves. Uh, so, yeah. And, you know, I'm thinking also, you know, it just comes down to that phrase, hurt people, hurt people. And for so many of us, perhaps our families are being hurtful without even necessarily realizing it. Or I've had this conversation with, um, I do a lot of, you know, talks in Mandarin for like Chinese immigrant parents and people like that. And someone once confided in me this notion that sometimes they feel almost envy when they see the way that their kids are living this happier, more carefree, less burdensome, quote unquote, um, life. And, because it feels like the kid is give it, getting to live out the childhood and then the comfort that that parent never had the chance to have. And I think that's unfortunate in the sense that, you know, it's a human desire, right, to want those types of comfort, to want that sort of livelihood. But then at the same time, as a parent, you also want your child to experience that, even if you didn't. So what I learned from that conversation was to try to adopt a bit more empathy in the way that I talk with my parents about these things, to realize that sometimes, you know, they might view it as an attack on their parenting abilities, or that they might view it as a rebuttal of, or like me being ungrateful for something that they so desperately wish they had the opportunity to have. But recognizing that we come from different baselines, different expectations. And at the end of the day, if I'm seeking help, it's for the betterment of my whole family to stop that painful cycle and to do it for my community rather than just for my own self-fulfillment and I think having that approach and that frame of mind when I talk with my parents about it has been very helpful yes and I, I think that's such an interesting topic that you brought up like it's just a little bit of like you know I wish I could have done that you know from a parenting standpoint and I'm, I'm not a mom I mean I'm a mom of a cat that doesn't really help me with anything but um <laughs> I, I could understand like my parents like I wish I was if I was your age like you know we survived the war you're, you're talking about emotions like what you know like come on like we might you know my father was captured in prison for trying to escape for two years and he still made it out here and you know alive and free and happy and working you know his heart out 
and he's like, are you really going through emotion? Is this like a fairy tale thing? Are you like, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult for them. Like, we, you know, if we were in your position, we would go right at it. We would go and achieve all of this and we would be okay. And you're dealing with that. So it's, there's definitely a very different perspective. And, you know, I wouldn't say for my parents, you know, was, you know, jealous. It was more of, you're so, um, you're such a, you know, my, my dad always makes fun of me, you're kind of, you're kind of a softy, you're kind of fragile, or, you know, or, or the term that they, they would say, like, you're a little snowflake, <laughs> so I was just like, you know, it's just like, okay, dad, all right, like, good, you know, all right, we, we don't, we need to have this conversation, if you're gonna, like, you know, say it like that, but definitely, that's such a great, interesting idea that you brought up, you know, there could be, you know, a little bit of, you know, jealousy, and it's also a little bit of, I could have done it better than you, in a way. Yeah, it's hard conversation to have for sure. Uh, and I, I, I feel you on that, you know, it's always a classic. Well, when I was your age, I had to deal with X, Y, Z, and you're just here playing club penguin or something. Uh, but I think ultimately, one thing that uh, I think in my experience that really helped me in that regard was I was diagnosed with this eye disease when I was 14, and it made me go blind every time I had an eye episode. And that physical illness was something that my family took very seriously. You know, I think in a lot of our families, even when we are not willing to talk about mental health, when it comes to a physical ailment, it's a lot more obvious and something that people take a lot more as a validating like situation. And over the years, I went to like hundreds of doctors, did hundreds of tests. Nobody could figure out what the heck was causing my eye disease. It took until a few years ago when I went to a conference and I was talking about my story. And this Vietnamese American ophthalmologist came up to me afterwards. And she mentioned to me that it could be that my eye disease is psychosomatic, which is a psychological, I mean, physical manifestation of psychological distress. And that seemed to me like so impossible at the time. But then that was around the same time that I started getting persistent mental health care for the first time in my life. And as my mental health got better, so did my eyes. And like for the first time, like I spent half of high school in and out of hospitals. And, in, and once I you know, started getting better mental health treatments, I went episode free for like the past three years which to me is an unbelievable thing, but I think it also highlights how for a lot of us, we get pushed to the point where the suppression of our emotions and the invalidation of them forces our bodies to manifest that pain in physical or more visible ways so that we will finally take it seriously. But sometimes by that point, it can be a little too late. And so it's very unfortunate that that happens, but it's just something that I don't know, it made me think about that when you were talking about your experiences. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it's a it's a battlefield, and especially um, being an, an an actor, it's you constantly have to use your emotion. And some stuff that I talk with my coach about that we have to bring back to be able, like a Meisner technique or you know an acting technique, we have to bring back the traumas in our lives. And I told him this is not healthy. Like <laughs> I need to have a therapist on the side. And uh, maybe my methods is not healthy or whatever. And he's just like, you, you know, we, we talked about it and it's just crazy. But now I feel like I can be able to control and be aware of my emotions and be aware of what's going on in my life and in the past. So I can be able to take care of the present and then the future. So, yeah, I appreciate that. And you know, sort of on that topic in terms of like the present and going to the future, we've seen in this past year, especially, you know, that huge rising anti-Asian um, hate crimes with some cities seeing over a thousand percent increase. And so many of these crimes seem to target our elderly. Um, and it's for me very disheartening and I'm sure for you as well. Um, I'm just curious if you can share a little bit about if that increased racism has affected you, your mental health, your family. Yes, um, so it's just insane what's how fast things have been going on from the pandemic to the Black Lives Matter and the whole presidential election and all this chaos that's happening. And now it's the anti-Asian bias. It's, it's very, it's almost insane how like how fast things are going. And it's like we're repeating history in a way, but it, you know, my friends and I talked about it and it has caused a lot of stress and anxiety and confusion. Um, there was like a lot of videos that was very graphic that I saw on social media that's, you know, the lady that got kicked and the security guard 
didn't do anything. They just closed the door on her. And to watch, you know, these elderly, it's, it's just getting beaten up and it's just, you know, they're, you're happy to know that they are compensated. They have the GoFundMe page. That's great that people are reaching out, but it's just, you can't help but wonder like, why, why now? Like, why is this happening? And what are we going to do from it to prevent that? Or is that going to happen again, 10 years down the road? Is this like a cycle? What is going on? And I, my friends are worried that lives in Orange County in the Vietnamese district, um, Little Saigon, Westminster area, they're afraid for their grandparents or their parents to go out and they have experienced that even though I can't, you know, disclose it here. I don't know if it's, it's sad because it started to, I don't want people to think it's a trend, you know, it's, this is not tolerated. I, I do not wish this upon any race or anything like that. And it's just so sad. And I am really worried for my parents as well. And, and we're very confused, but it's also good to know that the Asian community, like we're all speaking out, like, you know, the, um, there's a lot of nonprofit organization, like this is our time to speak out about it. Cause if not like now, then when we have brought this up many times before I'm like from a small town, I have experienced so much racism before I moved out to California. Of course, this is more like open and people are more diverse, but I'm starting to get a little bit of like the, the little trauma. Like, yeah, you know, I can, I know we all know the eyes of racism, we, we see it. As a, a colored minority person, you, you see that when you you know walk down the street, you know that you're don't, you don't, they don't want you here. You don't belong here, basically the message. So I hope we can be able to, you know, make a change that will help the, you know, the younger generation to be able to know how to deal with it and cope with it and hopefully, you know, make a, make a positive change. Yeah, for sure. I feel you on that. You know, when you, especially when you mentioned, like, it feels like it's a cycle. It just makes me think back on Asian American history, how some of us, especially like, uh, for example, Filipinos, um, due to the colonization and et cetera, like, Asians as a whole have been in this country sometimes since even before this country was the United States. And then I think about, you know, we have the not just railroad workers in California, but like the Chinese immigrants and such, but then also, <laughs> 1982, the murder of Vincent Chin, where it was quote unquote justified because people thought that the Japanese were stealing American jobs and Vincent Chin, who is not Japanese, but then again, doesn't even matter in this situation, was brutally beaten to death just because of that. And I'm thinking about how now we see that parallel in people blaming people who look Asian, whatever that means to someone, um, blaming them for the virus, blaming them for the pandemic, for the shutdown of businesses, etc. And it just feels so disheartening, especially when you like, and, and I don't think it's right to blame this on any like specific type of person, like, you know, but if you compare it to like the British variant or other variants coming from non-Chinese origins, you don't see that same sort of hatred. And so it comes down to like, you can try to deny a you, not you personally, obviously, but like the general public tends to want to deny that, you know, this is something that has a racial component to it, but the fact remains just starkening. Like, you know, it's, it's hard to dismiss that. And I'm thinking also about how like my parents, we own a small food and beverage company and we sell a lot of Chinese food. And I'm thinking about how my parents who don't speak English and don't understand the attacks that people say to them or try to threaten them with. My dad was doing a delivery of our cheap Chinese food because no one wants to, <laughs> no one wants to, to, to not be able to enjoy our foods, our cultures, even at the same time as they might be dismissing our pain. Uh, my dad, while he's doing this delivery, he gets his car rammed by someone who shouts at him and calls him a chink in the parking lot. And of course, he has no idea what the heck the person is saying because he doesn't speak English. And when I have to explain to my parents what the heck the word, the sound of chink means, it's just so heartbreaking and infuriating. Uh, and so maybe, I'm, sorry, maybe I'm getting a little emotional here. I'm just thinking about it, it just makes me angry. Uh, I think, you know, so many of us have sacrificed so much to try to make it here to be that, that quote unquote model minority, even though we never should have had to be in the first place. And it just feels like, very invalidating. Yeah, and I'm so sorry for what your father went through. That's that's just like it's 2021, and it just that's just not acceptable. We have 
um, social media, we have cameras and it's just crazy how, you know, they think they can just get away with it. And you're absolutely right about it. I think what we want, you know, for our Asian American community, we were very quiet. We were known to be very conservative. We just wanted to go to work and be able to, you know, take care of our families and, you know, to be picked on like that. It's insane. We just want the right to be able to speak up and to be able to, you know, work and be safe. Can we just go to work and be safe? And, you know, and it just, it's just awful. And I kept seeing more news about, you know, the Asian hate crimes and it's just definitely like, it's very worrisome things. And I'm just very sorry again about, you know, what happened. I don't know. I mean, I'm glad that we are having this conversation and sort of decompressing a little bit with each other in that solidarity. And to sort of wrap this up then on an optimistic note, you know, what are some ways or strategies you have to protect your mental health to um, hopefully pave a better a better path towards uh, well-being? Well, personally for me, and I, I don't know if anyone else, but I, you know, I love art so much. So it definitely helps me a lot. I love art therapy. I love to kind of indulge myself into my work and studies. And I'm, you know, a PhD candidate right now. And I'm learning about just being able to kind of thank you, be able to recognize what's going on in my life. What can I prioritize? What can I organize? Because when you're in with school and you're working and you're auditioning, it's it's a very chaotic. We tend to, you know, society teaches us how to kind of be independent, learn to do everything by yourself. You know, you, you have to, you know, do this, do this. So it's just a lot. So I've learned to meditate and pray a lot. Praying, it's a study shows that your brain is just like, it, it changes when you pray. And I, I, I definitely pray. I definitely meditate. And I definitely put time for myself, putting myself first, because I can't be able to help other people around me. And I think that's important because when you're on the plane and they, they teach you all this about like, if something happens, you got to put your oxygen mask on first, you got to put the mask on first before you put it on another person. I got to help make sure, make, make sure that my life and myself, my mental being is okay before I can help someone else. So, you know, taking the time for myself to breathe. <laughs> I'll try to breathe more. <laughs> yeah. I bet. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, I also find arts and uh, meditation in many ways very helpful. I'm not as much of a practicing Buddhist as I used to be, but I still follow a lot of those philosophies. So I'm glad to hear you bring that up. I think also for me, I found a lot of, well, it's equal parts joy as well as sometimes frustration in looking more into the education of the Asian American history, of uh, the history of race and other different types of intersectional identities in the US and beyond. Because on one hand, you know, it's frustrating because it's like, oh man, I feel like we're stuck in this cycle over and over. But then at the other, on the other hand, recognizing these patterns and having this historical knowledge to feel more validated in our fight uh, and to know that we're not fighting this alone. We have generations before us and after us who will continue this good work. It feels empowering in many ways and helps bring me a sense of hope. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome. Uh, I know we have just one last question about what advice we would want to give to our younger selves about mental health. Uh, separate advice I would give to myself about mental health. I kind of like, to, like from the get-go, I said to find the right people to talk about it to. You got to be very careful of that. You know, you can open it up and, and talk about it to them to see what where their standpoint. But if you're very fragile, I definitely recommend to have someone that you look up to and discuss that with so that you can get the help that you need. You know, because, you know, if you if you're feeling really low, your vibration is low and you're definitely need the help. I would recommend finding the right person instead of finding someone new to talk about it to because you don't know how they will react to it. That's personally just my you know personal advice. And uh, life is hard. So don't give up on each other. And definitely don't give up on yourself. So yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think I would also want to give myself something uh, more on those lines. And specifically, I'm thinking to my younger self, I was very confused on how to navigate the American healthcare system. And I think now that I know it better, I would say like, hey, 
know that there's not just hotlines, which are oftentimes meant more for times of crises, but that there are also warm lines, which might allow you to have conversations with people who are trained, but outside of a crisis situation, so you don't have to wait until that point. And then also know that there's things like sliding scale payment therapists who offer you, um, you know, sessions depending on what you are able to pay, that they're group therapy sessions that are oftentimes cheaper than individual sessions, community centers that offer these services, even, you know, uh, peer groups like NAMI, which are awesome, Letters to Strangers, our online platform for letter exchange and all of that. There's so much out there that are trying really hard to be accessible for people and it can be confusing to navigate and overwhelming to do so, but it is worth it and you are worth it. And that is time well spent, so. Thank you so much uh, for joining me in this conversation and sharing your wonderful insights with us. Thank you for having me. Your stories are incredible. You're doing an amazing job. And I think that's, you're right. We're definitely, we shouldn't feel so afraid because, you know, we have all these amazing nonprofit organizations coming together in our community always. We're very strong. So I am not afraid of what's going to happen in the future. We are a very strong community and we will come together and we will fight for what is right and we will stand up. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, and if people want to find you online, where can they find you? Oh, they can find me on Instagram. I'm just Ann Tin Fan, as A N T H I E N P H A N. And you can also find me on my website at antinfan.com. And I'll be more than happy to, you know, talk to you guys. If you, I, my DM is crazy, but if you message me, I'll eventually get there and I would say hello. I would love to say hi. So, yeah. Awesome. And I'm at Dizodin, D-I-Z-Z-O-D-I-N. It's fun to say. <laughs> and you can also find us at letters to strangers.org. Thank you.